peace with her death and with the life events that follow after that. Now, before we take a look at what the portion says and what happens to the portion, we should take a brief look at what happened during her life. For a large portion of her life, the Torah doesn't say very much. Uh, to be sure, there are a lot of Midrashim about Sarah's warmth and hospitality, but the Torah itself doesn't say much. We know that she was 65 years old and Avram 75 when they left Haran, and that, what, that she was his wife but also his half-sister. She also was a reputed beauty. Apparently, uh, Pharaoh's officials raved about her to Pharaoh, and of course, twice she fudged the truth about being about her relationship to Abraham. And all that takes us up to when she is now 75 years old and still barren. In fact, when Sarah is first introduced in the Torah in the Parashat Noach, we are immediately informed that she is barren. Accordingly, at age 75, she knows that Avraham, Avraham has uh, been given a promise of many descendants by Hashem, and she since concludes that Adonai has prevented me from having children. So she proposes to raise up a son for herself through Hagar, the Egyptian handmaiden she probably acquired when Avraham and herself uh, sojourned in Egypt. This is a plan who, that is proposed by someone who seems very resigned to her fate, to her barren state, like God was finished with her with regard to offspring. And we know how the plan all worked. Some may view Sarah as being harsh toward Hagar, but remember that Hagar, a handmaiden, looked down on Sarah after Hagar realized that she could get pregnant when Sarah could not. And we can also note that Tor never directly criticizes Sarah, but always actually backs her up in regard to Hagar. When we fast forward to when Abraham is visited by the three men and Sarah is promised a son, Sarah is skeptical, not daring to hope, but one year later, at age 90, she has a son, Isaac, and she is, of course, overjoyed. The next recorded episode in her life is when Abraham is asked to take his son, his only son whom he loves, Isaac, and sacrifice him. We know the story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Rabbinic opinion is that Isaac was in his 30s and was exactly 37 when this happened, and that Sarah, when she found out that her only son, begotten late in life, almost died, she herself died from the shock of it. Now, why this thought? It's because last week's portion, Vayera, ends with uh, the binding of Isaac narrative, and Chaye Sarah begins with her death. For good measure, it also throws in a mention about the existence of Rebecca, the great niece of Abraham, in preparation for the events in this week's parasha, Chaye Sarah. So this portion actually begins saying that Sarah's life was 100 years and 20 years and 7 years, the years of Sarah's life. And she died in Hebron in the land of Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, with this first couple of verses, it's uh, the subject of a lot of speculation by the rabbis. Why is her life spelled out in these divisions of 100, 20, and 7? Why did Abraham come to mourn Sarah's death? Was he somewhere else? Why wasn't he with her? And so forth. But the chief point is that Sarah is the only woman in the Torah whose age at death is given, so it must be important. And we can somewhat see the importance in the events that follows. The first thing is that Sarah's death spurs Abraham to find a burial site for her and for, her, for the other descendants. Uh, some interesting bargaining takes place between Abraham and the sons of Chet, and this is the portion that I'll be reading today, for the field and cave of Machpelah, which belongs to Ephron the Hittite. Ephron offers it for free, and Abraham insists on paying for it, and in the end, Abraham pays 400 shekels for the property. There's a debate as to if Abraham paid an exorbitant fee or fair market price. We don't have great market data for that point in time. But uh, whatever the price, it, the implication is that Abraham did not underpay. According to tradition, the cave of the patriarchs, as it is known today, is said to house Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and Leah. And next we move on to the courting of Rebecca in chapter 24. Uh, Abraham makes his servant, not named but assumed to be Eliezer, take an oath to find a wife for Isaac back in Abraham's native land for, and for, from his relatives. The servant goes on his way, and when he gets to the town, he prays that the woman who not only offers him a drink, but also offers unprompted to water the camels as well, would be the one. And Rebecca does just that. At which point, in the original narrative in real time, the servant gives her some expensive jewelry, uh, a gold nose ring, and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. Shekels were valued by weight rather than a monetary amount. The servant then discovers that Rebecca is related to Abraham and spends the night with the family. Rebecca's brother is Laban, and the passage describes his response to the servant like this. As soon as he, Laban, saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, saying, 
Thus the man said to me, he went, he went to the man. There he was, standing by the camels at the spring. So he said, Come in, blessed of Adonai, why are you standing outside, when I've tidied up the house and there's room for the camels? And obviously, Laban saw that he was about to get an offer he couldn't refuse, money. Laban saw shekels and uh, took this as a hint. We can take this as a hint of how Laban was going to be later in, in the Torah. The servant recounts his tale to the family with a few changes, such as he gave Rebecca the jewelry after he discovered she was Abraham's relative rather than before, as in the original narrative. And eventually, Rebecca agrees to go back to Abraham and Isaac with her family's blessing. Again, there's uh, Midrash and theorizing about what various words and changes indicate, but essentially, it doesn't really change the, the main story. They travel back, and Rebecca is approaching their destination, and she sees Isaac from afar. And as soon as she espies this handsome man, she falls off her camel. How romantic. <laughs> when she discovers that the, the handsome man in her sight is in fact her intended, she covers her face. Isaac takes her into Sarah's tent, and she becomes his wife, and he loves her. Torah then says, so Isaac was comforted after the loss of his mother. So if we look back at Sarah's life, we realize she didn't become a mother until the last 37 years of her life, less than one third of it. The whole time, she walked faithfully with God, and in the end, he rewarded her. If we look at Isaac, he was 37 when his mother passed away, and even by today's standard, that's a rather young age to lose one's parent. Three years later, at age 40, he married Rebecca. Since the last verse of chapter 24, verse 67, says that Isaac was comforted after the loss of his mother, we realize that Isaac must have been close to his mother. We realize that she had a profound impact on his life, and he was very saddened at her passing. We also see in this passage that Isaac was meditating in the field in the evening when Rebecca first saw him. And the sages say that uh, this is actually the origin of the, uh, the minka, the afternoon prayers. Her influence is that he continued to connect with God in the three lonely years between her death and his marriage. So what about Abraham and Ishmael? In chapter five, that, uh, that gets wrapped up. Abraham takes another wife, Keturah, and she produces several sons. Yet again, there's rebinning speculation as to who Keturah was and why Abraham remarried at such an old age, as he would have been upwards of 147 years. However, in the end, Isaac alone remains Abraham's heir, while Abraham gives Keturah's sons, Keturah's sons gifts and sends them away. Verses 7 and 8 say, uh, Now these are the days of the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. So Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, old and satisfied. Isaac and Ishmael bury him in the cave of Machpelah alongside Sarah. As far as Ishmael is concerned, he becomes the ancestor of 12 princes who dwell on land east of Egypt. He dies at age 137 and is gathered to his people. One rabbi has observed that Abraham had offspring from the three sons of Noah, Sarah who comes from Shem, Hagar who comes from Ham, and Keturah who comes from Japheth. However, even though Abraham gave birth to three streams of nations, Hashem's uh, covenantal promise to Abraham came only through Sarah and her son Isaac, and that has a great significance of her life. <laughs>